This is the Everything 80s Podcast, episode 25, 20 of the best bands of the 1980s. Hey guys, what's happening? Welcome back to the Everything 80s Podcast. I'm Jamie. Thanks for coming on out today and looking at 20 of the best bands of the 80s. We'll look at, well, who they are, see if your favorites made it, what made them so great, what they were doing um, that was unique, what they were doing like album sales wise, who was, um, you know, sort of changing the game and what the landscape of the 80s looked like as far as everything to do with music. Before we get to that though, if you haven't already, Do me a favor, um, do me a solid, subscribe to the podcast wherever you like to get your podcast these days. There's a lot of them. I should be there. That way you get them automatically when they come out. Okay, let's do this thing. Okay, so when we're looking at, I don't know, where do you begin? There are debates that the 90s are the best period of all all time for all around music that ever existed. Um, And I think very good points could be made for that. But if you want to look back on some vintage and iconic groups, bands, and music, you look no further than the 80s. This is a decade where you're evolving into some new music formats that never really existed before. You've got hip-hop, new wave, um, and some evolving versions of punk rock and heavy metal. Disco has thankfully died a quick death. And in the 80s, it's bringing more of a period of upbeat and fun music. It's It's a decade where things are going relatively well. Like you've got the era where, I mean, every decade's obviously got its own train wreck issues, but in the eighties, you know, people are, are just, you know, there's the yuppie movement coming. People are making money. Um, however you want to look at the economy, like no one, no one really is paying attention to like government. They're letting it do its own thing. And, you know, there's more entertainment now available and technology's growing and, um, video games and, the Walkman is out and, you know, it's just more of a, a period of progression and a lot of, you know, upbeat, fun music. Um, there's no, you know, you've don't, you don't like what I said about like the issues with the government. You don't have the crazy discernment of what was going on with Nixon in the seventies. And, you know, things are just seeming to like run fine in the background. People are making more money and happy to like spend it on all this cool new stuff. If, if the 70s were a bleak time, then the 80s are the tailgate party. I'd say that would kick off the weekend. And I think it's reflected in the music. You've got a lot of novelty acts. Uh, the focus is on more of a good time. Um, so, I mean, this whole thing is going to be based more around my opinion, which means it's the definitive and final answer on all of the bands in the 80s. So we'll see how you uh, match up with what I'm saying here. So kind of in no order. We'll go and we'll start with the first, not necessarily number one. Let's just say no particular order here. So the first group we'll look at is the Beastie Boys. So the Beastie Boys never sucked. They were always good. They never had any down periods where their music took a hit. It's, I think in the 80s, nothing embraced that party attitude than the sort of frat-based Beastie Boys formed in... New York City in 1981, the Beastie Boys were made up of Michael Mike D. Diamond, Adam MCA Yoke, and Adam Adrock Horowitz. They they have sold 26 million records in the U.S. and 50 million worldwide. They've had seven platinum albums and are the biggest selling rap group since Billboard started recording sales. They started as a punk rock band but moved more into hip hop and then signed with Def Jam in 1984. Hard Rock was their first release single with Def Jam, and then they released the iconic License to Ill in 1986. Arguably, their biggest hit came from this album with You Gotta Fight for Your Right to Party and No Sleep Till Brooklyn, which hit number seven and number 14 on the charts, respectively. So huge, huge part of my childhood, the Beastie Boys. I, I mean, Obviously, all of these are, but like I was big into rap in those days in the 80s whether it was like them or l o cool j run dmc cool mo d I, I liked even the novelty stuff like um dj jazzy jeff and the fresh prince and like tone loke and young mc but like i like that you know public enemy so th- that was more what i was gravitating to at the time okay next top 
20 band of the 80s, Bon Jovi. I used to have to hide Bon Jovi tapes under my bed as I thought they were so badass that I was going to get in trouble for listening to them. It was like considering how tame it is when you look back, it, to me it was almost like the devil's music. Um, it was real rock. It was hard rock. It was anthemic. It was still accessible. It was arena rock music, you know, stadium rock. Uh, I remember pretending I didn't love the song Bad Medicine, um, but I secretly loved them just because everyone else was liking them. Formed in 1983 in New Jersey, Bon Jovi today today is made up of John Bon Jovi, David Byron, Brian, Tico Torres, Phil X, and Hugh McDonald, but have also included Alec John Such and Richie Samboro. Runaway was one of their first big hits to crack the top 40 in 1985, and in 1986, they put out their giant album, Slippery When Wet, which contains You Give Love a Bad Name and the greatest drunk song ever written, Living on a Prayer. That album sold 20 million copies and had three top 10 singles in it. They put out their album New Jersey in 1989, sorry, 1988, and it contained other classics such as Bad Medicine and I'll Be There For You. Okay. Third Beth. See, these aren't in order. I'm just numbering them off so you know where I'm at. Okay. Millie Vanilli. And bear with me on this. Also, where do you start with this? This can be a whole different podcast on its own, but they are synonymous with the 80s, even if it's for all the wrong reasons. The group was founded in 1988 by Rob Farian and consisted of Fab Morvan and Rob Pilatus. They had massive hits, whether you like to admit it or not, with All or Nothing and Girl, You Know It's True. They were one of the biggest selling pop acts of the late 80s, um, and everything ended up great, except that it didn't. It was discovered that Morvan and Pilatus did not sing any of their vocals and were forced to give give back their Grammy for Best New Artist. None of this would have happened if um, they didn't have a pre-recorded track that started skipping during a live performance on MTV in 1989. Considering all... It's incredible. This is like front page news and like... It was like a... You know... um, people committing treason it was all if you think of all the lip sync crap and enhanced backing track vocals and recordings that now exist in music it's crazy that this was the biggest scam in the history of pop culture at the time you know um and ended up in some pretty bad situations but they are a very symbolic um and synonymous group of the 80s okay next group one of my fa- favorites, Run DMC, and the Run- and Run DMC is they are the Beatles of rap. in In the eighties, the new and emerging style of uh, music was being released from the Bronx in New York City. It was called hip hop. It was a way for people to share their way of life and what they were seeing that was happening around them. It was really just a mirror of the society they found themselves in. It was set to hard hitting beats and the rapper's voice or the MC, it was kind of used as like an additional instrument. So rap or hip hop was starting to explode, but a three man group from Queens would take that to the next level. Formed in Hollis, Queens in 1981, Run DMC was made up of Daryl, DMC McDaniels, Joseph Run Simmons, and the late Jason Jam Master J. Mazel. They were the first rap group to have a gold album, which was in 1984, and also be nominated for a Grammy. They were the first to go platinum, multi-platinum, and the first rap group to appear on MTV, and first to appear on American Bandstand, and then on the cover of Rolling Stone. That like these are the Beatles of hip hop. Some of their notable albums were the 80s. From the 80s were Raising Hell, uh, and King of Rock. Notable songs include Walk This Way, My Adidas, It's Tricky. It's like that. I mean, they got a huge catalog. goes all the way back. I love Run DMC more than anything. They blew my mind. I owned everything they put out. Uh, yeah, massive fan. Okay, next biggest band, U2. And disclaimer, I am not the biggest U2 fan, so I'll just get that right out of the way. I am in admiration of what they've accomplished as a band and the influence they've had on music. I just, I don't know. Bono and the, I don't know, whatever. I won't get into it. Not the biggest fan. <laughs> but like the Beastie Boys, U2 actually has some punk rock roots and then evolved into more of a rock band. And they were formed in Dublin in 1976. They were made up of Bono, The Edge, Larry Mullen Jr., and Adam Clayton. 
no no um, relation to Clary Clayton. War would be their big album for them in 1983 and included the massive hits Sunday, Bloody Sunday, Pride in the Name of Love. Um, I mean, those are big enough hits to go for the rest of your life on. Their biggest album in the 80s, I'd say, would be 1987's Joshua Tree. It made them worldwide stars and included the hits With or Without You, and I still haven't found what I'm looking for. They put out an experimental album sort of movie thing called Rattle and Hum in 1988 and have sold more than 170 million albums worldwide. Okay, next in the top 20 greatest bands, and you might not agree with this, but again, from my perspective, the Fine Young Cannibals, and I'll tell you why. I love them. And when I think of songs and groups of the 80s, these guys just always come to mind. Like if you're thinking of like snapshot moments and 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 songs that represent a decade, You Drive Me Crazy is that hit. It's That's their big sweeping hit. And I think it encompasses the sound and the music of the 80s. It's got that, you know, punching snare drum sound and the heavy power rock chords, you know, sort of a definitive blueprint song most people don't know they were british and they started in birmingham in 1984 they were made up of david Steele, andy cox and roland gift their site their self-titled album came out in 1985 and then the raw and the cooked came out in 1988 which contains she drives me crazy and also the very underrated good thing remember that song both those songs went to number one so they made a big impact, even if it, like if you think of all the competition, the music out at the time, they went to number one. So it wasn't a long lasting impact, but they still made it. They called it quits in 1992. They shortly reformed, or sorry, yeah, reformed in 1996, but that was fine young cannibals. Okay, next biggest band of the 80s, REM. Another disclaimer, I'm not an REM fan. Let's get that out of the way. You can send all the hate mail you need, but they are an important rock band and a significant part of the eighties. So they should always be on a list like this. So don't say I never did anything for you. Formed in Athens, Georgia, 1980, 1980 rapid eye movement or REM was made up of Michael Stipe, Bill Perry, Peter Buck, and Mike Mills. They're really, they are really the first big alternative rock band and they had a unique guitar sound also some really unique uh, vocals from Michael Stipe they're that like college band sound that just took that sound to a worldwide stage 1983 would see one of their first big albums with Murmur and that that's when they become that sort of quintessential college radio band I'd say they have a big hit in 1987 with the one I love they signed with Warner Brothers in 1988 and I think were able to be still a a very conscious and political band while still playing arenas. You know what I mean? Like that. Some people see that as a contradiction um, in itself that you're selling out all this stuff. I I think they still were kind of loyal to their, their message and what they stood for. Okay. Next top band, new order. And I have been appreciating new order now more than I ever did at the time. It's um, They created such a unique tone and atmosphere with their music, and they really brought electronic music and dance rhythms to the forefront. And recording technology is starting to change, and New Order is really embracing it, and again, creating that, er, that sound of the early 80s. They are formed in 1980 in England, and they're made up of Bernard Sumner, Peter Hook, and Stephen Morse. They were formed after... The band Joy Division had a whole tragic situation, and they combine a post-punk approach with that electronic, you know, and dance music. They're huge in the sort of New York club scene and the like, sort of second invasion that was happening with you know bands that would happen like uh, Duran Duran and Spando Ballet and that whole movement. And their massive hit Blue Monday was released in 1983 and was the highest-selling 12-inch single of all time. Just go, if you, I don't know if you listen to like um, Spotify or Apple Music or whatever, go back and listen to New Order. It's amazing to hear what they were creating early, early in the 80s. And it wasn't just about being technological for the sake of technology because now they had all these new tools at their disposal, but it was really creating legit substantial music. And again, songs like Bizarre Love Triangle is one of the greatest, you know, 
dance songs ever recorded. Going with that note, I'm actually going to go in a little um, follow that British pop sort of thing. Next top band, the Pet Shop Boys. And so the, we're continuing this electronic British music invasion, and that involves the Pet Shop Boys. Formed in London in 1981, they were made up by Neil Tennant and Chris Lowe. Low. They're actually considered the most successful duo in British history. They've won countless Grammys and have sold 50 million albums. They were another one that embraced this new electronic sound. They put out songs like West End Girls, Love Comes Quickly, Opportunities, and they did that cover of Always On My Mind uh, that Willie Nelson and Elvis had done. They, I always thought they had a bit of a blondie sort of sound to them. Uh, again, like everyone's kind of taking all there's so much new music and experimentation happening and I, I think you can hear these little influences in each of them that leads us to our next one of the english invasion duran duran it's again like depending when you grew up or how old you were you you might not know or think of it but duran duran was a, like a phenomenon they were like at that same sort of um bieber Backstreet Boys, New Kids on the Block. Like they were in that sort of same mix with like girls going nuts over them um, or whoever the hell's popular at the moment. They started in 1976, also in Birmingham, and helped to develop that new wave sort of English synth pop sound. They're kind of an alternative band in 1982, but become a like world powerhouse in 1984. They, Duran Duran was smart because they embraced the concept of video, which was becoming important thanks to the launch of MTV. This was nothing new for British bands because they'd been used to making like kind of music videos, like pre-recorded like segments because of the English show Top of the Pops. So they knew all about packaging themselves, performing in these like three minute little chunks, um, production values, which caught a lot of bands and groups in the U S off guard when MTV was launched because they didn't know how to adapt to this new format. The, the British bands had no problem with that. And that's why I think we see that massive influence of all these groups because they can embrace this new medium. Some notable Duran Duran songs, uh, 1982's hungry, like the wolf Rio, a view to a kill, uh, ordinary world. They were Duran Duran's kind of like a boy band before there were boy bands. They were, Girls loved them, and guys generally pretended they didn't like them, uh, which kind of leads to our next band, New Kids on the Block. If you <laughs> if you wanted a girl to like you in my primary school, you better have known and loved New Kids on the Block. Girls didn't want any – I don't know if this is across the board. This is in Canada. I assume it was wherever you were. They didn't want anything to do with whatever that didn't involve Joey, Danny, Donnie, Jordan, and Jonathan. I thought they weren't that bad, honestly, but there was no way in hell I was going to admit that to any of my friends. Formed in Boston in the early 80s, New Kids on the Block were the brainchild of Maurice Starr trying to find a new version of New Edition. It started with him hearing a 15-year-old Donnie Wahlberg rapping, and he helped to recruit the other members. Their debut album came out in 1986, and it was just full-on bubblegum pop. It's One of their early hits was Be My Girl. Then they put out Hanging Tough in 1988, which it's pretty much pure pandemonium from there on out. Their huge break of hits were You've uh, The Right Stuff, Please Don't Go Girl, Cover Girl, Hanging Tough. You know, you know the whole new kids on the block phenomenon. There have been plenty of acts that cause chaos from girls, but new kids on the block, I think, really they took it to another level and they set the stage for those other bands like Backstreet Boys and NSYNC and everyone like that. Okay, let's go to a non-British or whatever boy. Wait, actually, they are British. No, they're not British. This is Aha, and maybe more of a one hit wonder, but it was a pretty massive one hit. And again, like I was talking about fine young cannibals and the definitive sound. If there is arguably, if you had to pick one song to represent the entire 1980s, it might be take on me. And you can fight me on that if you want. Aha was formed in 1982 in Oslo, Norway, which I don't know if everyone was familiar with. They were or familiar with, they were made up of Morton. These are going to be brutal names. Sorry. Martin Harkett, Magne for Holum, and Paul Wakater Savoy. Pr- close. They released Hunting High and Low in 1985, and that contained Take On Me. 
What also led to their and the song's success was the groundbreaking video for Take On Me that everyone knows that we've all seen a million times. They also have another decent hit with the song The Sun Always Shines on TV. It's not bad. Listen to it. They were nominated for a Grammy for Best New Artist, and Hunting High and Low was actually one of the best-selling albums of 1986. And I don't think I'd ever listen to the whole thing, but I like I did, and it's actually really good. So again, check it out. Here's a fun fact. They're credited by the Guinness Book of World Records for having the biggest rock concert of all time with 198,000 at Rock in Rio. Uh, and that lead singer, um, what was his name? Morton. He has the record for the longest held live note in 2001 with 20.2 seconds. Okay, we're still going on back to England. More Brits, I'm afraid. And we're going with the Culture Club. It's hard to argue Culture Club not being one of the best bands of the 80s. Um, now that, we'll, like here, I'll show you why. Formed in London in 1981, they're made up of the um, iconic Boy George, Roy Hay, Mike Craig, and John Moss. Boy George really captured the public's attention and at the very least confused a lot of people, but that still created big interest. But they could back it up. And insanely talented musicians, writers, uh, they had... You know, their big hits, Do You Really Want to Hurt Me, Time, Karma Chameleon, I Just Want to Be Loved. Karma Chameleon was the biggest hit of 1983, and they are actually a massively influential group. They won the Grammy for Best New Artist, and their album, Color by Numbers, has been considered one of the best albums of the 80s. They were really good. Go back and listen to it. Uh, You might sort of like pigeonhole them as like being a little bit too novel and the whole boy george thing but they're pretty awesome okay getting a little harder here music wise of the top bands of the 80s guns and roses the the complete opposite to the culture club representing a true hard rock style you've got guns and effing roses formed in la in 1985 they're made up of the original band axel rose slash duff mckagan izzy stradlin and steven adler Appetite for Destruction was released in 1987 and proceeded to kick the living hell out of everybody. They come out of the gate super hot, and it was the number one album a year after its release, which is incredible. Sweet Child of Mine reached number one, and they sold 30 million albums worldwide. Not that you don't know, but other notable songs are, you know, Welcome to the Jungle, Paradise City. Um, Yeah, I mean, iconic band. Here's some fun facts. Previously considered band names before Guns N' Roses can would include being called Head of Amazon and AIDS. They those were their actual names they were playing around with. Okay. Keeping this intensity going with the top band of the 80s, NWA. And <laughs> again, you know, me being a big hip hop fan, and a lot of people would probably agree, NWA scared the living crap out of you. Um you don't have to like them, but they made their mark in history. That's for sure. They took rap to a whole new level. They helped bring gangster rap to the world. Everyone is familiar with NWA. Formed in Los Angeles in 1986, they were made up of Dr. Dre, Ice Cube, Easy E, DJ Yella, and MC Ren. Um, yeah, I all I remember is a friend's older brother having an NWA tape and having to go over to their house to listen to them because I did not dare bring that tape into my house i wouldn't even you couldn't even this is an interesting time where we actually had record and tape stores i even if i wanted to even if i was brave enough they would not have sold me an nwa album this is like the parental advisory era just about to start um and people were on the lookout for all that sort of thing and again i was listening to dj jazzy jeff and the fresh prince um among other rap where there wasn't really cursing except the odd hell or damn so NWA is nuts and they were showing the world that things are not all peaches and cream. It's not like all MC hammer and dancing. They, they were showing where they lived and they weren't afraid to show um, the real ugly side of life. And especially with um, where they were in South central Los Angeles and um, the issues with the police and their monumental album straight out of Compton comes out in 1989. It's got massive hits such as, I've got, so I don't lose my rating, F the police, and then obviously straight out of Compton. 
they um they really they did change the course of music and again getting into the issue of censorship and free speech and you know the, one of the first albums have the parental advisory stick sticker and it the amazing thing you, you've probably seen the movie straight out of Compton Compton which is really good and or if you want to watch a brilliant brilliant documentary is called um Oh crap! What's it called? It came out on HBO, and it's about Dr. Dre and Jimmy Iovine. Um, oh man, it's a four-part series documentary. I'm gonna make myself remember it. Um, it's like the Game Changers or, or whatever, and it's just showing the evolution of NWA and and Dr. Dre specifically. The amazing thing is, without any airplay, with zero videos on MTV, no radio stations touching them, and overall fear of this album straight out of Compton, it went double platinum. That's incredible. If you think about it at the time. Okay. <laughs> As the complete opposite to NWA, the next top band is wham. <laughs> Don't laugh. It'll show why. Um, they are, you know, if you th- just read from the name, like the name wham has the exclamation mark in it. And like, I mean, that tells you everything you need to know about this group. They're formed in London. London's making pretty good music at the time. In 1981, Wham! is made up of George Michael and Andrew Ridgely. They were influenced by funk and soul music, and they put out their first album in 1983. It was, and it's weird to think of this, but it was actually a political album about the unemployment problem, problem in England for young people and their issues with being dismissed by adults. They they would change things up in 1984 when they released Make It Big, which included the monster Wake Me Up Before You Go Go, Careless Whisper, and Everything She Wants. This album was huge in 1985. It was a big hit on the U.S. charts. They sold 30 million albums, and they were the very first Western pop act to be able to perform in China. This They did a 10-day tour, and it was seen as actually being an important step in improving the China Western relations. Wham actually did that. So thank you, Wham. And they also gave us what I think is the greatest Christmas song of all time, Last Christmas, released in December 1984. And we cannot debate that. That's just how it is. That show is the documentary. I was just thinking of the the defiant ones about Jimmy Iovine and Dr. Dre. It's awesome. Okay. Getting to the last few now. Again, and now we're going back to the Brits again. And this is Def Leppard. And this is my hands down my favorite rock group by far of the 80s. They're the perfect band. They are stadium rock. They have awesome sounding guitars, catchy anthemic hooks. Um, They also didn't scare the crap out of me like Iron Maiden and Judas Priest. Formed in Sheffield in 1977, they would be one of the top bands of the 80s and their music used by strippers everywhere. They're made up of Joe Elliott, Rick Savage, Rick Allen, uh, and Steve Clark. And they started with their album High and Dry in 1981, and this allowed them to be one of the first rock bands to be played on MTV. They were just came out at the perfect time. Pyromania would then come out in 1983 and went diamond. And that doesn't happen a lot. That's 10 million albums sold. And it's ranked in the top 500 albums of all time by Rolling Stone. In 1987, they released the monumental Hysteria, which features iconic songs such as Love Bites, Pour Some Sugar On Me, Armageddon It, Rocket, Animal, Woman. Like this is a this is like the monster album of the 80s. It went on to go 12 times platinum. Okay, so Def Leppard is honestly not just one of the biggest bands of the 80s, but of all time. They've sold a hundred million albums. And they have two albums with the RIAA Diamond Certification. So just to put that into context, there are only five rock bands and two original studio albums that have sold over 10 million albums ever. That's it. And Def Leppard is one of them. That's how big that band is. Okay. Keeping this move going, we're looking at Metallica. Um, with the the rock train here and now we're moving more into heavy metal and to me and I probably a lot would agree the best metal band of all time formed in 1901 in Los Angeles Metallica was made up of Lars Ulrich James Hetfield Dave Mustaine Ron McGovney now you need to include Kirk 
Hammett, but I'm not going to get into all that history. That could go on for a while. Big albums in the 80s would include Kill 'Em All and Ride the Lightning in 1983 and 1985, respectively. Master Puppets would come out in 1986. It would go gold and then six times platinum. And Justice for All would come out in 1988. Some notable songs through the 80s would include Fade to Black, For Whom the Bell Tolls, Seek and Destroy, and One. I've seen a lot of concerts from every genre you can think of, and Metallica is probably the best live act I've ever seen. There, there's a lot. I, I don't know. Like I've seen notable ones that stand out. I've seen Robert Plant. I've seen Sting. I've seen Jay-Z. I've seen, but like as far as energy, performance, execution of it, like Metallica, I don't know. They might take the cake. Okay. Last two here of our top bands of the 80s. Uh, next one, In Excess. And another band that really captured the sound of the 80s, Originally formed as the Ferris Brothers in Australia in 1977, the founding members were uh, Gary Beers, Andrew Ferris, John Ferris, Tim Ferris, and Michael Hutchins. And they had a combination of sounds embracing that new wave sound and pop, but they would also incorporate in a harder rock style with, but also with like some funk and dance elements. They're all they're kind of like a hybrid band. Originally big in Australia, but albums like Listen Like Thieves and Kick would bring them worldwide fame. Some notable songs include Never Tear Us Apart, Devil Inside, Suicide Blonde, Need You Tonight. Uh, probably know like Hutchins would pass away in 1987, and they would incorporate some other singers into the band. I actually saw them on one of their sort of replacement tours i forget who was singing with them it was that guy jd fortune is that a real name who won one of those contests they were they were still awesome as a band they were amazing i was right on the i was working at an arena that was doing the show and i was like right on the side of the stage so i was like with them like looking at the crowd and they were awesome okay and next last but not least as a top band of the 80 80s public enemy If NWA was being profane about what they were describing around them, Public Enemy was taking a more conscientious approach. One of the biggest hip-hop groups of all time, Public Enemy was formed on Long Island in 1986. They were made up of Chuck D, Flava Flav, Professor Griff, Carrie Wynn, and DJ Lord. They are a politically charged group, but one that you needed to pay attention to. They were not just a radical hip-hop group, but one of the most radical and influential groups of all time. If you're a big Rage Against the Machine fan, you can hear Public Enemy in all their music, and that was a big influence. They were trying to recreate Public Enemy sounds, but with just like drums, bass, and guitar. Their first four albums were all certified either gold or platinum, and obviously big songs are Fight the Power, 911 is a Joke, Welcome to the Terror Dome, Bring the Noise. Um, yeah, iconic band they used to open for the bc beastie boys actually but luckily were able to branch out and then you know become this significant amazing important band okay let's let's wrap this up thank you (laughs) thanks for staying with me on this joyage of uh 20 of the best bands of the 80s obviously i've just scratched the surface i mean this topic can be its own podcast altogether feel free to yell at me for what i miss but again from my perspective which is 100 percent correct so we've just got to go with it And again, like an amazing time for music in the 80s with all these new genres and ideas that were coming out of it. Uh, You know, MTV now is how we're consuming music, which hadn't before. We're being exposed to music we'd never heard because we were restricted to whatever was on the radio. That's all we could listen to. Now we're seeing all these different things and we've got new technology like the Walkman and that's allowing us to take our favorite music anywhere we went. Music's becoming like customized and personal in the 80s. I think that's the big difference. Whereas you you know before you had like a record or an eight track you could only listen at home or maybe in your car and you were limited to whatever was on the radio even if you could tune in a good radio station now whatever you like you could take with you and enjoy on your own and you didn't have to listen to like top 40 crap or whatever you know you now you've identified and seen these new styles in music so i think the whole business and the culture just exploded from that so you know a great time in um in the culture and also led to another iconic invention of the 80s the mixtape so let's leave it at that thanks for listening hope you like the show again please subscribe if you haven't already if you really like the show do me a solid give it a rating and review 
that helps everybody out. Okay, I'll see you next time. Bye.